Now, some, some of you will remember my saying that my first aim when I came to City Journal 11 years ago was to hire Theodore Dalrymple, whom I considered simply the best journalist in the English-speaking world. This task turned out to be less straightforward than I expected. There was, I found, no such person. <laughs> there was instead, behind the nom de plume, or nom de guerre, I should probably say, of Theodore Dalrymple, a modest and diffident doctor working in a prison in a slum hospital in a once grand but run-down industrial city in the British Midlands. The pen name did away with the need to disguise his patients when writing about them. He'd simply disguise himself. And it also served to disguise the fact that, despite two medical jobs, he also turned out as much writing as two full-time journalists. Half the output, you say, could go under his real name, Anthony Daniels. What is amazing about this vast output is both its peerless quality and its breathtaking range. Now, nobody, in account for, nobody can account for talent, or in this case, genius. I won't try. But two definable things at least help explain Tony's achievement. First is his rootedness in concrete reality. Working for 15 years as a doctor and psychiatrist in the slums and the prison, he isn't an abstract or theoretical student of the underclass, but as up close and personal a one as you can find. His knowledge is not of statistics, but of individuals in their full humanity, their complexity and contradictoriness, and often enough, invulnerable in extreme circumstances. He knows what they say about themselves and their world and what they believe. He knows what kind of homes they've grown up in and what kind of homes they make for their own children. He knows them in some ways better than they know themselves, and he writes about them better than any social scientist could ever hope to do. Second, Tony is about the best read person I know. And his reading, particularly of the literary greats, has given him a deep sense of how ideas form the social reality we live in, for good or ill. Conservatives, anti-Marxists that we are, understand that ideas have consequences. We like to quote Keynes's quip that most statesmen are in the intellectual thrall of some defunct economist whose obsolete ideas were once all rage. And we well know how ideas... Okay. And, and, we, and we well know how ideas of this kind give rise to institutions, the welfare system, say, or the organization of the school system, that mold our society in the most direct way. But as Tony shows in our culture, what's left of it, do you three doctors want to go over and take a look? <laughs> <laughs> but we have three more. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but as I was saying, as Tony shows in our culture, what's left of it, ideas mold our world in another deeper way too. The ideas that we get from our culture about what's right and wrong, about what makes a meaningful life, about what our duty is or whether we have any, about what our relations to one another should be like. Western ideals about the dignity of the individual or personal responsibility or the golden rule or the work ethic, ideas forged through the experience and reflection of generations are the foundation of the incomparable freedom and prosperity we enjoy today. But more recent ideas, formed among the elites but quickly diffused among everyone, 
Ideas like the importance of sexual liberation or that distinctions between higher and lower, better and worse, are mere instruments of oppression, are molding a very different sort of world. And in Britain, as Tony shows, it is a world in which the underclass, with all the human suffering it involves, is growing in the midst of prosperity, and in which the social order that was the work of so many generations is so visibly and violently fraying. We at City Journal are extremely proud that our culture, what's left of it, is the second collection of Tony's City Journal articles and the 13th book that has grown out of City Journal stories. And that's in five years. And I'm delighted and grateful to announce as well that our friend and chairman, Dietrich Weissman, has generously established a new Manhattan Institute fellowship and that this talk will be the first in an annual series that Tony Daniels will give as the first Dietrich Weissman Fellow. Tony Daniels. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Myron. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a great pleasure as always, to uh, come to the Manhattan Institute. Uh, but on this occasion in particular, I should like to take the opportunity of thanking Mr. Weissman most sincerely for having endowed the uh, fellowship uh, which has been awarded to me, and I shall do whatever I can to prove worthy of it. Um, I should also like to thank, of course, uh, Maher and Magnet, without whom my uh, little book would not have been written, and without whose fatherly eye and attention to detail which is not always uh, pleasing or immediately gratifying to an author, <laughs> it would have been very much the worse. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a collection of essays such as this book, uh, written over several years, must be a little uh, disparate. But there's nevertheless a theme that runs through our culture, what's left of it. And it's this, uh, that ideas are important, that they are ultimately what determines the shape that our lives take, that intellectuals have a deep, if not always a direct, influence upon the society in which they work, because it is they who originate and then spread ideas, that bad ideas have uh, bad social consequences and in the process uh, ruin many individuals' lives, and that it follows from all of this that they, uh, the intellectuals, have a great and indeed unavoidable responsibility to the society in which they uh, live and work. And it's also my contention, uh, which I uh, outline in this book, that many intellectuals, among them some of the most in uh, influential ones, have discharged their responsibilities very poorly over the past century, uh, if not the past millennium. And. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and have helped to bring about uh, catastrophes on both a large and a small scale. Well, it was George Orwell who said, to see what is in front of one's, eye, uh, uh, one's nose needs a constant uh, struggle. He also famously said that we have sunk to a depth in which restatement of the obvious is the first duty of intelligent men. Uh, but to state what is obvious or describe what is in front, in front of one's nose is, from the intellectual's point of view, uh, rather infradig, uh, the equivalent, I suppose, of talking about the weather. It should, after all, require no special training uh, to do so. The intellectual, therefore, arrogates to himself the rather more elevated task of discovering what is not obvious what lies underneath the surface or uh, behind the masks. And he becomes the uh, modern equivalent of the Gnostic, uh, with the result that moral values are easily reversed, and what was formerly thought good becomes evil, and vice versa. And this has certainly happened in my own country, Britain, and uh, moreover, it has happened as a mass uh, phenomenon, which I think you would, uh, if you visited Britain, uh, would see on the streets uh, every day. Well, in the book, uh, I give examples of intellectuals' attempt, often a very successful attempt, uh, to ignore the obvious and to reveal uh, hidden characteristics and uh, uh, connections and thereby uh, to attain a new wisdom. 